The military coup in Turkey is over and President Erdogan's crackdown is in full swing. As of this writing, the government has already detained over 10,000 servicemen, among them more than 100 generals and admirals. Another 8,000 police officers have been sacked and nearly 3,000 judges and prosecutors have been dismissed. Furthermore, roughly 15,000 officials from the educational ministry and about 23,000 teachers have lost their jobs. The list is still expanding, but thus far, Erdogan's purge has affected nearly 60,000 people. In Turkey, there is relief that the military takeover failed. However, there is also a surreal dark side as uncertainty looms over the country. In this report, we will look at the consequences of the failed coup and what Erdogan's purge means for Turkey and the region. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Before we analyze the outcome of the coup, we must go over the historic developments that explain how Turkey came to this path of violence. Starting in the 1970s, Islamist factions in Turkey realized that overtly ascending to power was not feasible. The army, led by Kemalists who adhered to the founding policies of Mustafa Ataturk, was the guardian of secularism in Turkey and their devotion was reflected in the many military coups that the country had experienced. In essence, there was no way to directly challenge the secular army. Instead, grassroots movements were set up. One of these movements was founded by Fethullah Gülen. The cleric was inspired by Said Nursi, a Kurdish Sunni Muslim theologian who emphasized a fusion of Islam with Western science and education. Gülen held sermons and soon he attracted followers who shared the belief that Turkey should embrace Islam but also learn from the West. Adherents of the movement see themselves as reformers, opponents however see Gülenists as heretics. Either way, the following decades, Gülenists climbed the ranks of the military and established new businesses and schools in the Middle East, North Africa, the Caucasus and Central Asia. By the 2000s, the Justice and Development Party also known as the AKP, came to power. Their reforms led to an economic boom and from there the AKP gained a formidable support base throughout Turkey. Yet, despite high approval rates, the AKP's future was ambiguous. The military was still in charge. This reality compelled the Gulen movement and the AKP to team up and focus on Kemalists within the military. A number of major trials followed and within a few years the AKP and Gulenists had broken the back of the military. Many Gulenist figures had replaced Kemalist officers and commanders. Once the dust settled, relations between Erdogan and Gulen took an ugly turn. In 2010, following the Gaza flotilla raid, Erdogan, in an attempt to reinvent the role of Turkey in the Middle East, criticized Israel. A year later, the Turkish president involved his country in the Syrian civil war. Gülen in turn criticized Erdogan for his reckless behavior and so a bitter rivalry was set in motion. A few years later in 2013, Gülen followers ignited a corruption scandal in Turkey by publishing audio records of Erdogan's inner circle. It was a major blow to Erdogan but this was only the beginning. A year later, political allies of Erdogan were accused by Gülenist prosecutors and Erdogan himself was personally criticized by Gülen for his crackdown of the Gazi Park protests. Following this, Erdogan hit back by designating the Gülen movement as a terrorist organization and started to shut down Gülen sympathizing schools, media offices, banks and businesses. Turkey's political landscape was being purged of Gülenists, but one sector still remained untouched, the military. Then in 2016, the Turkish intelligence agency received a leak that a military coup was imminent. The country's leadership intended to detain the perpetrators ahead of the annual Supreme Military Council meeting in August. However, the coup planners too were aware that their cover was blown and thus stepped up their plans and executed it on July 2016. It was a brief and intense moment but in 24 hours it was over. The coup had failed. Now it was Erdogan's turn to retaliate and purge the military of Gülen sympathizers. As of this writing, Erdogan's crackdown has affected about 60,000 people. 
Most of them are civil servants such as teachers, officials, judges and prosecutors. Even most of the detained servicemen have little to do with the coup. Yet none of this matters. For the president who sees the failed coup as a gift from God, the situation offers an opportunity. Erdogan will exploit the aftermath of the coup by increasing civilian oversight over the military such as placing the internal troops and coast guard under the command of the interior ministry. In this attempt the AKP will find support from the other political parties, meaning Erdogan's purge will succeed but its efforts will come with restraint. There are limitations to what the president can really change. For example, Erdogan cannot remodel the country from a secular to an Islamic form of government. Such a transition would lead to an economic meltdown which in the long term would hurt the AKP's support base. Therefore, a more feasible goal to increase influence is for Erdogan to seek more executive powers by reforming the constitution. This forms Erdogan's ultimate goal. However, even this endeavor will meet with resistance from the other political parties. Either way, setting aside the constitutional reforms, the current ongoing crackdown will also carry unintended consequences. For one, the coup attempt and the political crackdown comes at a delicate time for the leadership in Ankara. In neighboring Syria and Iraq, Turkey's fight against ISIS is heating up. Even within Turkish soil, the conflict with the Kurdish militant movement, the PKK, is escalating. The changes in the Turkish military will disorganize and confuse the ranks. Routine exercises will be thrown into disarray and mistrust will spread in the chain of command. Military operations against ISIS, PKK and other Kurdish militant groups will continue but the combat readiness of the Turkish military will decrease. The government might recover combat readiness by restoring military personnel just as they did in the 2003 purge, but this will not happen anytime soon. With Ankara distracted, Kurdish militant groups in Syria have expanded their operations across northern Syria in an attempt to connect the Kurdish controlled territories. The activity of Kurdish forces in northern Syria has been a long and sensitive issue for Turkey. Ankara believes that its territorial integrity is threatened with the contiguous Kurdish controlled territories along the Turkish border. In fact, in the 2016 prognosis report of Caspian Report, we forecasted that Ankara would launch military operations in Syria in an attempt to put down Syrian Kurdish forces. As of August 24, that scenario has unraveled. Turkey has launched military operations in northern Syria after Kurdish forces ignored calls to retreat. What happened is that in early August, Kurdish forces took the city of Manbij. Prior to the takeover, Ankara and Washington had agreed that Kurdish forces would retreat east of the Euphrates River after taking the city. However, Kurdish forces didn't retreat and so Turkey responded. Interestingly enough, the Turkish invasion of northern Syria comes exactly five centuries after the Battle of Marij Dabik, which took place near Aleppo and allowed for the Ottoman dominance over the Middle East. However, unlike the historic battle, the current Turkish operation is a cautious incursion. Ankara will try to avoid getting drawn deeper into the Syrian battle space, but unexpected events are bound to occur. In order to minimize a geopolitical blowback, Ankara may seek a compromise with Moscow, Tehran and possibly even Damascus. This outcome is all the more likely due to the public reconciliation between Putin and Erdogan. Ultimately though, compromising and cooperating with the Russians doesn't mean that the Turks will abandon their policy on Syria. The reconciliation between Russia and Turkey is mostly a PR stunt. A handshake does not change geopolitical interests. Both countries will remain bitter rivals. The same geopolitical conditions apply to the Turkish-American relations. On the surface, it seems as if Turkey is distancing itself from the United States and NATO. Anti-American sentiment in Turkey is increasing. Yet, despite appearances, the geopolitical understanding between Washington and Ankara have actually improved. For example, the Turkish military operation in Syria is conducted in cooperation with the United States. 
Even more importantly, Washington has supported Ankara's ultimatum to the Syrian Kurdish factions. There are of course many conflicting interests in Syria, but these examples indicate that the Turkish and American interests do have an understanding. Essentially, Turkey needs the United States and vice versa. Ankara cannot deal with regional issues alone and Washington cannot contain Russia without Turkey. Despite the calls to downgrade relations, the geopolitical realities will limit any kind of major alteration. Ankara's membership in NATO is as secure as during the Cold War, and the US military will not be expelled from Turkey. The same principle of necessity applies to the European-Turkish relations. What appears on the surface contradicts the reality underneath. Ankara has played a fundamental role in containing the refugee crisis as laid out in the migration deal. However, following the July attacks in Germany and France and Erdogan's crackdown, the migration deal is on thin ice. Some factions within the EU want to reduce cooperation with the Turkish government by adding additional conditions to the migration deal, such as the case for Ankara to reform its counter-terrorism laws and to abandon plans to reintroduce the death penalty. As a result of these changes, Brussels will have a difficult time honoring its part of the agreement with Turkey. As of this writing, it's doubtful whether the Turkish visa liberalization will pass in the European Parliament or if Brussels will maintain the promised financial aid to Ankara. This puts the EU and Turkey in an awkward position. On one hand, Brussels needs to preserve the deal with Ankara. On the other, the deteriorating political landscape in Ankara cannot be left unaddressed by Brussels. Thus, the most likely outcome is that the relations between the EU and Turkey will appear to regress as both will criticize each other, yet in reality, Turkey needs the migration deal as it increases Ankara's leverage in the European bloc and the European Union needs the deal because it reduces the flow of refugees. In essence, the challenges that lay before Ankara may seem daunting, but the PR between Turkey, Russia, the United States and the European Union does not reflect the reality. Essentially, despite the public outcries, which are meant to appease internal opposition elements, every player will work hard to maintain the current agreements. This was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. Special thanks to the following people on Patreon for their amazing contributions. And if you wish to help with the costs of the show, please visit patreon.com slash Caspian report. For now, thank you for watching. Take care and Saul.